There we go. Nina, welcome. Hi. Hey, how are you doing today? Where are you, where are you hold up at? I guess there would be sort of stuck somewhere. Yeah. Well, I see you're holed up with a giant piece of steak. It's a good place to be, right? <laughs> I've actually got a two pound sirloin roast sous vide right now for me for later, <laughs> later this afternoon, later this morning, actually my lunch. So, um, I'm in rural Connecticut, actually. Is that where you're from? Is that uh, where you're normally at? Uh, no. I actually live in New York City most of the time, but we have a place outside of New York, luckily, to which we have uh, flown, fleed, and so, um, and we've been here for over a month now. Okay, well, that's, that's nice. I mean, great. Can, I guess so we're I... very lucky to at least have a place where we can breathe and go outside and not have to get in an elevator to go up and down stairs. Yeah, what's, uh, I don't know, is Connecticut, I mean, some places have different levels of restriction where, you know, some people, it's like, you're not allowed to go outside for almost any re you know, you have to have a mask on in some cities and some places, it's, you, they yeah. don't want you to go outside at all. And I don't, are they doing that in Connecticut or is it a little more? I don't know if masks are required, but pretty much everybody's wearing one, but I'm not in the area, the areas in Connecticut that are having the highest rates of infection are mainly along the coastline where the, the sort of the communities where people routinely, um, they commute into New York City. So we're not in a place like that. And we're in a little town and it's just not that, the, the infection rate is not that high. So yeah. it's a place where everybody keeps themselves anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting times because there's a lot of discussion now about, uh, you know, one of, one of our favorite topics is, our, you know, there's a food system in general, you know, there's concerns about, um, you know, food supply and, uh, you know, people marking up food while, it, while the food is rotting on the vine, they can't get it out, can't, can't get it out fast enough or they, they want to tell people to, you know, euthanize animals or dump food or dump milk and it's kind of kind of bizarre how things are playing out right now. But um, I think most people here are aware of, you know, your work that, you know, the, the great book you wrote, The Big Pet Surprise, which is, a, which is an outstanding book. It's gotten a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of people have read that. Most, I imagine most people here and they're all clapping for it. But, and, and uh, Terry, Terry, the carnivore chef's holding ver a copy of it up. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously when you wrote that book, I don't know that you expected your life to sort of sort of revolve around this, you know, you're coming from where you were before, but it's certainly changed and you, you know, you're doing great work trying to, trying to, uh, you know, make our nutritional guidelines evidence-based. Um, I want to start with that because I know that's a, that's a, a passionate topic of yours. I mean, you're working with, you know, the 2020 nutritional guidelines are trying to, trying to influence those. And what are you seeing with that right now? I mean, we've got Sonny Purdue, the secretary of ag, is he, you know, going to do the right thing, or what? What are, you, what are your thoughts on on where that's going right now? Yeah. So, if you don't mind, I'd like to just give people a little bit of background on the diet. Go ahead. Of course, of course. A lot of people <laughs> don't really know what they are or why they're so important, and and maybe I'll just explain why I got involved at all because. Um, what happened was that my book came out and um, in 2014, and then 2015 was the dietary guidelines were going to come out that year. They're the, they are the government's main nutrition policy. They come, they're supposed to be updated every five years. They're issued by both the U.S. Departments of Agriculture and Health and Human Services. And most people have heard me say this before, but I need to say it again, which is that most people really do not think the dietary guidelines influence them because um, you don't go to a .gov website to look up your diet. You, um, you know, you just, most people think that it's some far away policy that doesn't affect them. So here are some of the ways that this policy affects almost all Americans. So one is, and, and this includes even Folks like I would assume that are in your chat group here or in your community, Sean, which is that people who feel like I completely ignore the guidelines in every way in the way that I eat, so it doesn't affect me. But um, 
they affect your, so when you go to the, they're, they're virtually downloaded by all nutrition professionals. So your doctors, nutritionists, dietitians, uh, nurses, when if you are, go to the hospital, if you encounter a, uh, a medical professional who, who thinks you're crazy for eating your diet um, that doesn't follow the guidelines or is, or is uh, you know, people often find their doctors are hostile to them. Um, that's because they've all been trained in the guidelines. So everybody who thinks who gives, who's getting dietary advice from any healthcare professional is getting the guidelines. The guidelines are more fruits, vegetables, you know, nuts, seeds, whole grains, uh, low fat, dairy, and lean meat. That's pretty much what the guidelines tell people to eat. The food pyramid, the my plate, all comes from the guidelines. Um, all the feeding assistance programs, so so the the meals that are um, that are given to kids in schools and to your elderly parents in their nursing homes and in hospitals and in prisons, captive populations they don't have a choice, and military is fed the guidelines. So we have these huge populations that are these that are in large institutions that all get the guidelines. It's taught in K through 12 education. The whole uh, food supply switched over to become low fat and all cattle was bred to be lean uh, with the guidelines. So, you know, that's why one of the things that we all, many of us search for are, is, is pork that is not super lean, that doesn't taste like sawdust because everything was bred to be lean in order to comply with the guidelines. Anyway, so, they're very influential. They're probably the single most important food lever on what Americans think is a healthy diet and, um, and what we get served in all the institutions that we and all of our loved ones go to. So I didn't know this when I was writing my, I didn't quite realize how important they were, but the report came out, this, this every iteration, they appoint this expert panel to oversee the latest science of the last five years. And I looked at this expert report from the 2015 and, you know, I had just spent a decade of my life studying nutrition science, like every study, thousands, thousands, thousands of studies and all the data on nutrition. And I looked at this report and I just thought, I don't see any of the science that I know here. There's none of the clinical trials are here. The, like, all of the major NIH funded, government funded, huge clinical trials, the most rigorous kind of science you can do, none of that was in the report. And then I went back and looked at previous reports that had been done every five years. It had, and none of it was there either. And so I was just astonished how our guidelines have ignored, basically the story is we have this incredibly important nutrition policy that seems to have no, ignored every pretty much every single rigorous clinical trial that's ever been done um, and relies instead on this kind of science called epidemiology, which shows association, but not causation, but it is a much weaker type of science. So it's, it's like we've built this whole food pyramid on a foundation of sand, this weak, weak science. Um, and why did we ignore the clinical trials well because for you know ever since the 1960s every time they would do one of these studies they looked they would they would put people on on diets reduced in fat saturated fat lowered down you know cut meat cut dairy and the results would be no benefit no benefit no benefit for heart disease no benefit for cancer no benefit for helping people lose weight no benefit for preventing diabetes or or actually reversing diabetes and so those results just had to be ignored or not published in many cases. I mean, some of this I write about in my book, but they just had to be ignored. And I, I didn't realize quite how much they had been ignored until I studied this, like I went through all the dietary guideline uh, documents. Anyway, so that's how I became obsessed. I realized this policy was so important. It wasn't based on science and then much like my book, I just kind of went down this rabbit hole of thinking, well, we have to fix this policy. <laughs> I mean, I don't have any experience doing what I'm doing right now, which is trying to fix policy in Washington. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a whole other deal. Um, 
but I felt just like somebody had to do it. It just had to be done because the current dietary guidelines are not evidence-based, not based on good science, and are arguably really hurting Americans. Um, you know, with the obvious tie-in in today's COVID-19 environment being that people who have metabolic diseases are at higher risk for worsened outcomes from that virus. And why do we have a nation where 88% of the people have some kind of metabolic condition for which they're taking medication? And the answer is they are being told to eat poorly. So, um, you know, there's certainly there, the, the conventional argument is everybody just eats junk food and that's why they're all fat and sick. But there is another, I think, argument better supported by the evidence to show that people have followed the guidelines, have made a really good faith effort to reduce meat, increase grains, increase consumption of fruits and vegetables. And, and so that there are a lot of people who got ill and overweight by following the guidelines. Anyway, so back to your original question. I'm sorry for that long um, caveat, but uh, so where, you know, what are the chances that the guidelines will be um, fixed this go around? Um, there's a, a, an expert committee in place of 22 people. As you said, there's Sunny Purdue, the Secretary of Agriculture. There are kind of a few issues that we focused on. My group is called the Nutrition Coalition. And if you want to go geek out on the science, you can go to nutritioncoalition.us and there's all kinds of information there. Um, so we focused on a few issues. One of them is the main issue that we focus on is that it's really important that the guidelines just follow the rules of science, right? That they use a correct methodology for reviewing the science and, and put in really just simplistic blunt terms like clinical trials is a higher form of evidence, epidemiology is a weaker form of evidence, and obviously there can be bad clinical trials and there can be epidemiological studies with very strong effects and these, you know, you can grade these types of evidence up and down but you have to start with their sense that there is a prioritization of evidence. So the USDA guidelines just don't do that. They just don't do it. They, what they do is they put all the evidence together like in one of those lottery things. <laughs> they, just, they just mix it all up. And then they, they make a conclusion based on you know, some clinical trials maybe, but a lot of epidemiology and they don't really seem to prioritize it. And it's a method, importantly, that has never been verified. It has no, there's nobody else in the world uses this method. There are recognized methods for reviewing, doing these scientific reviews. And um, when the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, which is the highest scientific body in the land, did a review of the dietary guidelines process, they said two of their main recommendations were you need to use proper scientific methodology for reviewing the science. You know, and here are a few that you could use. And there's, there's a bunch of them out there that are well known, Cochrane, AHRQ, GRADE. I mean, and they said, please use one of these. And USDA basically, in the beginning, they said, we're going to sort of follow GRADE. And then they backed off that. And now they're not using any recognized methodology. So that's our kind of our number one effort and I think we have lost that battle at the moment. I mean, we've raised awareness about it, but they, they're, they're well on their way to being done with their draft report. It's due out in May, and they're not gonna go back and change their whole methodology now. Okay, so that's one issue. Second issue is around saturated fats. Um, as you know, saturated fats cause heart disease. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, ever since 1961, as many of you know, the American Heart Association has told Americans to cut back on saturated fats, mainly in meat and dairy, to avoid a heart attack. And the USDA dietary guidelines have recommended that as well since 1980. And I think in 2005, they started saying, well, we're going to give a, we're going to put a percentage limit on sat an specific percentage limit and they said 10 percent of your calories can come from saturated fats well that really is what limits um people's 
ability to uh, eat enough. I mean, if you're in a school lunch program or if you're getting your food in the hospital or whatever, if you, that's what limits your ability to eat um, animal foods, which are higher in saturated fats. Um, and so we, our group, um, we uh, funded a panel of top scientists from all over, well, mainly from the US, but also from Canada and Denmark to have a um, symposium where they got together and they wrote a consensus statement saying in the science, including three former members of the Dietary Guideline Committee uh, who, who joined together and came up with a, looked at all the science and said, look, the science really no longer supports or maybe never did support this recommendation on saturated fats. And they wrote a letter to the secretaries of agriculture and health and human services, and they submitted a public comment and they're putting their consensus statement. They wrote it up to be published in a journal. And the dietary guideline committee has completely ignored that. Um, so the little subcommittee on saturated fats is made up of only four people, all of whom are really on one side of the issue. Um, they all think saturated fats are terrible and evil. And, and one of the people, Linda Van Horn from Northwestern University or Northeastern University, anyway, she's one of the people, she, was, she actually worked very closely with Jeremiah Stamler, who's Ansel Keys' right hand man, if any of you remember that. He's from um, Chicago and he, so she is an incredibly staunch opponent to saturated fats and she suggested that they should lower saturated fats down from the 10% limit down to 7%. And then uh, Jamie Ard also on the committee who is a medical director of Optifast for Nestle, which is a non-food based weight loss solution. So he works for Nestle. Um, he said, why don't we just lower the saturated fats down to zero because we know that's a non-essential nutrient. Um, which is you know, not supported by any science at all. So we actually just uh, filed a complaint with the USDA um, Office of the Inspector General saying this subcommittee on saturated fats is biased, one-sided, um, and that actually violates um, certain federal regulatory statutes about committees having to be balanced and having to manage bias on their committee. And so we're hoping that that may have some impact. Um, you know, I think the, the bigger story is, is really that there's just this law, you know, there are these career bureaucrats at USDA that have been doing these guidelines for decades and they really believe in their guidelines and they truly believe that their guidelines are correct and that if only people follow them more they would be healthy and this is their firm belief and so they, they just I think it's almost impossible for them there's this incredible cognitive dissonance uh, with this idea that there might be something fundamentally wrong with their, their guidelines. Um, but they also do things that I think are, are not just rookie mistakes. Like if, you, if you're putting together a panel on a subject like saturated fats, which I think everybody knows is a contentious issue in the world of nutrition, you ought to balance that panel. And you ought to know that, look, if you're putting on Linda Van Horn, you need some strong person on the other side of the equation who's going to argue with her. And they didn't do that. So that is what gives me pause about the integrity of the people running this process. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder, Nina, but this sounds like it's basically just a an exercise to do it and it's more of a charade and the outcome is, is already predetermined. I mean, do you get that feeling that no matter what kind of science you put at these people, they're going to just give you the give you what they believe and, and, and not really, you know, change their minds? Um, I think uh, I, I do think we have a chance. I still think that we have a chance to impact this process. I mean, I want to say the guidelines have been going on now for 40 years, and this is the first go around where a number of groups have stood up to say, 
just no more, no more bad science. We're not letting this pass. We are writing in thousands of public comments. We are attending dietary guideline committee meetings to stand up and make comments. We, um, we are getting people to call congressmen. We are, I mean, this is the first time I think that people are, are really fighting this process. So I want to not be hopeless about it. I mean, I think there is a chance that we really could make a difference. Um, I think the process is not over. It's gonna go on through the end of the year. And I think with enough people raising their voices and complaining and, and really calling congressmen and saying, this is not, you know, this is not acceptable. Um, I think we, I do think we can make a difference. Um, and so that's why on, I want to tell you about one other group before, because, so I want to say that if you go to the Nutrition Coalition site, which is again, nutritioncoalition.us, I have to let you know, because I think we're the only .us site that I've ever heard of. <laughs> Nobody knows how to, I don't even know why we did that, but, um, there's another group that's been launched called lowcarbaction.org. And um, on both, in both our group and on lowcarbaction.org, which is mainly, it's made up of a bunch of low-carb doctors, there are, there are little, there are, you know, tabs where you can go and say, take action, and you can take action. You can, they will connect you with your representatives in, on Capitol Hill, They'll show you how to make a public comment if you want to do that. Um, and I think, I, I know from the people who I've consulted that if enough people do that, we will, we will be heard. I think that there's, I've just been told by enough staff members on the Hill, you know, if you make enough noise, people, they, it's just like having a bee in your ear, like you just want it to go away. So you, you feel like you have to do something. And that's why I think it's incredibly important for, you know, your audience, my audience, everybody to, to, to really um, make this an issue that does not go away. And I'll tell you a little bit more about low carb action. And, and the process of reviewing low carb diets, because I think that might be of interest to your community. Um, so there's a committee that is reviewing dietary patterns, a subcommittee, and they said, the headline news for them was, um, first of all, we couldn't finish our reviews in time for the last public meeting. So there's no transparency and we won't tell you what the results of our reviews are and you'll have no, you, and you'll have no opportunity to comment, which is completely non-transparent. Number two headline was, we couldn't find any studies under 25% of calories as carbs. So, so that's like the entire, you know, very low carb, ketogenic, keto literature, they couldn't find any studies. Well, you know, we, um, we have actually done sort of a review of the literature we, we keep or we used to keep now low carb action keeps this database of all the low carb studies and there are 52 studies it turns out and i'm not saying i'm saying clinical trial randomized controlled clinical trials or at least clinic controlled clinical trials on 25 percent of calories or less so that's a that's a decent amount of data that they can't find so i mean this is what we might call, um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it reflects like a tremendous bias that has existed for a very long time against low carb, which is no surprise to anybody here. Uh, but it, it's, there's, uh, there's, there's just been a bias against low carb. Why? Because, you know, maybe because it's the diametric opposite of low fat. So if you've been recommending a low fat diet, you just can't imagine that something like low carb could actually work. And, um, and so there has been this kind of systematic, I think it's fair to say suppression of the evidence on low carb, because I went back and did some Freedom of Information Act requests on the 2015 process, which was the last time around, and found that they had actually done a review of low carb diets back then but they had stuffed the whole review and didn't tell anybody they had done it and didn't publicize it. 
And then they put the results in this kind of, uh, you know, mealy mouthed way into the methodology section of the paper instead of in the diet section of the paper where it really belonged. And one member of the committee spoke up and said, you know, it's a large body of evidence. I don't think we should be burying it in the methodology section. And, um, and then he was, he was ignored. So I think it's, you know, I think it's fair to say there has been a suppression of this science uh, through a couple now cycles of the dietary guideline process. And again, as a way of giving hope to people and suggesting that maybe it's not impossible. I mean, these are serious transgressions of good science, good policy, and it just takes people to put together the facts, complain about it, talk about it, say this is not acceptable, this is not good policy, and, you know, and just try to like beat the drum about it. I think it's possible that, that, that you know, that this community or or people, anyone who cares about good policy can hold this group, their feet to the fire a bit. Do you find that, um, I mean, how much of this is influenced by things like grain subsidies and the fact that we, you know, a lot of our food-based system depends upon that? Do you think there's some reluctance to step away from that, that, that sort of economy that's been set up? I mean, when you talk about the financial conflicts of interest and there are financial and there are non-financial conflicts of interest in this whole story, the financial conflicts of interest are so vast, we could spend, we could spend the rest of the day talking about them. It's not just grains, it's also all the vegetable oil companies. Do you know that the dietary guidelines recommends 27 grams of soybean oil every day in your diet? and zero natural animal fats? Do you know that you're recommended six servings of grains? It's the fruits and vegetable lobby who, you know, who have successfully raised the amount of fruits and vegetables that are recommended to people, which that seems so benign, but it's just that there's every industry is trying to promote itself. The legume industry, the nut industry has been especially, um, active and so now there are more nuts recommended and so i mean it's just every there's just not a single food group or lobby that is not involved in trying to influence the guidelines um but there's more <laughs> there's also the pharmaceutical industry i mean one of the things that's interesting or astonishing when you start researching the field is why is every nutrition researcher getting money from drug companies. You think, what does that have to do with food? Aren't you looking at food-based solutions? Well, in fact, nutrition companies get tons of money from uh, pharmaceutical companies. And there are many reasons for that. But one of them, just as an example, well, if I'm a pharmaceutical company that makes statins, that depends upon the idea that lowering LDL is the most important thing you could possibly do to improve your cardiovascular risk, well then, you as a researcher will help me promote that by elevating vegetable oils um, over saturated fats, because that is, um, the, the whole rationale for that is to lower your cholesterol, your LDL cholesterol. So there are things like that. Or maybe you get money like, um, Mr. Optifast, who gets money to research how you can lose weight by non-food solutions. So what interest do you have in a food-based solution? Or, or maybe it's even more cynical that, that than that. You get money from people who make insulin, who would, who would not be particularly interested in solving, reversing type 2 diabetes in America. So there's a vast amount of pharmaceutical money that comes into all of these nutrition researchers. And it's, um, and, and it's, it's bizarre. I'm, I'm sure there's some good examples of maybe, you know, continuous glucose monitors and people who are genuinely interested in, in helping diabetics, but, but there's just a huge amount of pharmaceutical money that is unexplained. And then there's the non-financial conflicts of interest, which we talked about already, which is just the cognitive dissonance that comes from spending your whole career 
somebody like Linda Van Horn. She has been involved in nearly every single NIH trial trying to prove that a low fat diet, a diet low in fat and saturated fats and high in fruits and vegetables and whole grain is the solution to good health. She's been involved in trials costing billions of dollars collectively, the Women's Health Initiative, the MRFIT study, the DISC study. The, I mean, she's been involved in all of them. So how can she turn around and say, you know, actually, even though none of these trials had results that really showed any benefits, you know, I give up. I was totally wrong. I think that that is a level of cognitive dissonance that we can't really expect of most of our most researchers. And it's not just about your own intellectual um, in, in your inflexibility, but I think it's also that in, if, if you were to be one of these people who then flipped on all your colleagues, you would cease to get grant funding, you would cease to be invited to expert panels, you certainly wouldn't be invited to be on the Dietary Guidelines Committee, so you'd fall out of the nutrition community if you, if you fall out with their dominant hypothesis. And we have just, you know, I've saw that, I documented that in my book, I see that currently. And that is also why that many of the people who are researchers in this field who are at the cutting edge of the field, people you know like Jeff Bollock, they do not come from the nutrition community. They don't, they, he came from kinesthesiology, which is a word I always pronounce incorrectly, I'm sure I just did, but they come from outside the world of nutrition because then they do not have to alienate their longtime colleagues. So there's this intellectual, professional conflict of interest. And then I think it's important to mention that there are real ideological conflicts of interest now where um, there are many people in nutrition who have an ideological belief in a vegetarian or plant-based diet because they believe in the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist church. That's a very powerful group in nutrition or they, um, they believe that it's um, essential to solving the problem of global warming or, you know, they, there's just a number of fervent ideological beliefs that run counter to good, that are, that are, that are it's a different agenda than the agenda of nutrition and health. It's just a separate agenda. It doesn't, it's not, the science of nutrition is not applied in those agendas. And all of those, I have, I've seen and been able to document all of those agendas in this Dietary Guideline Committee, but also the, the one in 2015. In fact, if you want an interesting read, I just documented the Saturated Fat Committee. It's on a, a blog on our webpage. And one of the members in the Saturated Fat Committee is one of the leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist um, University. He's a longtime professor there. He's chaired their vegetarian conference like seven times. He has written an article about the success of the church in spreading the vegetarian diet worldwide. He is also a receiver of massive amounts of money from the nut industry and soy industry. So he's just got these, he's, sort of, he's got all the conflicts of interest in one person. And you, you sort of can't believe that these are the people who are in charge of reviewing the science. When I did actually write USDA and I said, do you not think it's a conflict of interest to have a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a fervent believer in the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, on your committee? And they wrote back and said, well, we don't discriminate based on religion. <laughs> that's, that's, that's amazing. And I, mean, I want to go back to just some of the science because you talked about uh, you know, saturated fat in particular. When we look at the data on saturated fat, um, you know, there's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different beliefs about why people are obese and have some disease. Some people will say it's just because we eat too much darn food. And, you know, clearly we have seen a, an uptick in our caloric intake over the last 50 years or so by the tune of, you know, whatever, 300 calories or whatever that may be per day per person. What is, what happens, you know, if we look at saturated fat in the context of caloric excess versus an isocaloric you know, situation. Do we have any good data on that showing, you know, maybe saturated fat is fine as long as you don't, you know, overindulge in 
you know, just calories. Is there any evidence that points one way or the other on that? Or is it unlimited free for all? You can eat as much as you possibly can until you're, you know, until you can't eat anymore type of situation. Um, so you raise a number of interesting questions. One is that, that it is true Americans over the last few decades, we eat more calories. I think it's 274 more calories per day than we used to. But in a chart that Jeff Volek shows that I like a lot, uh, it's 100% of those calories are carbohydrates. So we eat, when somehow we lost our ability to control our caloric intake, it, it, it was driven by carbs. And I think there is, I think that there's a, some amount of data to show that people can overeat on carbohydrates much more easily than they can overeat on protein and fat because, well, for a number of reasons. But part of that is that fat and protein are naturally more satiating. Uh, I'm sure you've, you know plenty about that. Uh, and, so, um, and so people cannot overeat on those foods too much. I do think that it is possible say to eat too many sticks of butter if that if you're if and 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 um and overeat on on calories that way i don't think calories are irrelevant um to weight control or weight loss um i think it's also very individually determined in that for instance i I mean, just as my own, I don't think there's, we, I don't think we have good data on this particularly, or maybe we do and I just don't know about it. But I have seen anecdotally, some people, including me, I get, I gain weight when I eat, you know, if I go to a diet that's very high in fat, I just gain weight. I, I need to have more protein in my diet. This is something that Ted Nyman talks about too. He believes people really need to have more protein and that's, and being a lower fat diet, that doesn't work for everybody. So I just think there's some variation in that. There has been some literature showing that saturated fats has an inflammatory effect in the presence of carbohydrates. And that's maybe what you're talking about. There's a number of studies that show that saturated fats and carbs, particularly refined carbs together, uh, create an inflammatory effect. And um, I think there's just a very simple answer to that, which is, okay, so what, you know, which of those things are you going to give up now? <laughs> will it be the carbohydrates or will it be the saturated fats? And the answer is, you know, there's, you, you clearly should give up the carbohydrates. Um, so problem solved. I mean, if there is that effect, which I'm not sure there is, then the answer is just not to eat carbohydrates in the presence of saturated fat. I don't know if that's too simplistic an answer for you, but I think that, um, like I'm not worried about saturated fats. I don't think there is any evidence to show that they have any damaging quality at all. Um, and they do have some benefits, known benefits, um, such as being the most efficient way to raise your HDL cholesterol for one. Um, and they are, um, I think they, I'm not positive about this science, but I have read a little bit about how they are contribute to the surfactants um, that are needed in your lungs, which in the era of COVID-19 is maybe particularly important. Um, so, but I, the, I think the strongest argument for saturated fats is that they are contained in many uh, really important whole foods that you need for health. Um, that those, that those, you, you don't want to be avoiding those foods because you fear saturated fats. Like the 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 complete, the complete uh, range of needed nutrients, minerals, um, proteins that are needed for human life, for growth and life and health are contained in the foods that also contain saturated fats. So you do not want to be cutting back or eliminating those foods based on a fear of saturated fat. 
Yeah, there's no real danger of that in this community. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> hey, I want to. I want to just train. I want to ask you about. Um, are we seeing some attempts for you know beliefs around environmental issues, sustainability, creeping into the guidelines? I know they talk about trying not to do that. Is that something that is still sort of people are saying? Well, we're going to go plant case plant based because we believe it's better for the environment. Although I would strongly argue that that's not the case. But are you seeing any attempts for that to occur? Not this, uh, not this time around. And I think that has to do with um, that is a that is due to the Trump administration's um, control over this, this process. I think that they, I think the Trump administration has completely ignored the guidelines as far as I can tell, but the, the one aspect that they are not going to allow to happen is, is for the consideration of sustainability to be included. And, and to be fair, um, it, it was included in the last round of the guidelines, but, um, but under the Obama administration, but Congress, um, I mean, regardless of whether you think that cows are the main source of global warming, which um, I don't tend to believe, uh, I think is, or I don't believe at all, <laughs> but, um, I think, it, and I think it's very important to have a sustainable food system. However, the process of putting together dietary guidelines is, is those are not uh, environmental experts. They are nutrition experts. They have one question and one mandate, which is to tell America what to eat in order to stay healthy or become healthier. And they have thus far self-evidently completely failed to do that. So why don't we just let them try to figure out the one thing that they were supposed to do before you add, we definitely don't want to make this diet sustainable. Um, and it's totally outside of their mandate and they don't have the expertise to do it. So, so I think it was a mistake to bring um, sustainability into the last round of the guidelines. And what happened at the end of them was that the secretaries of agriculture and health and human services were called down to Capitol Hill for a two hour hearing in front of the entire agriculture committee. And they were told the first thing they did when they sat down was, oh, sorry, we made a mistake and we're taking sustainability out of the guidelines. So I don't think, I think it would be a hard battle to get it back in there at this point. What is your uh, thought on, you know, Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue and his role? Is he is, is he complicit in this Igno ignorance of the evidence? Is he more open? Is he a better one than the last guy? I know, I think it was Vilsack, was, uh, wasn't, wasn't he the guy there in yeah. 2015? I mean, what, is it an improvement, a, a downgrade, or what's, because at least uh, Purdue is, is yeah, got... I don't think he's involved much, is mm -hmm. my impression. I, don't, I think that the, uh, you know, his high level, he, he, at, at this point, really, it's the job of the dietary guide, this expert committee of these appointed academics. It's really their domain to work on the guidelines. And it doesn't become an issue for, you know, higher up the political, into the political realm until the re their expert report comes out. And then they have, and then it, then it arrives in the desk of the secretary or the undersecretary or, and, and, you know, and they have to somehow look at this expert report and translate it into a policy and deal with all the people who are going to come scream at them because they feel like the guidelines, you know, don't include enough beans or too much meat or this or that. So at this point, it's not really part of the political process and, and they want to stay out of it. But um, so I don't think they're so involved is, but I, I mean, I don't have really top notch intelligence about what exactly is going on at USDA. I think one observation I can make, which really astonished me is the, the degree to which the staff really run the whole process. I mean, they, they, they had completed reviews before the dietary guideline even met. So it was like the guideline committee is in some ways a little bit of, it's, I mean, I think they're trying to do their job, but to some extent, you really think they're, they're a bit of window dressing for the staff, which really has strong ideas of, of, of how to run this thing. 
you know, bureaucrats running a policy is, I think we've all read about that in poli sci class. <laughs> Do you think, and Nina, I mean, obviously every country, I mean, not maybe not every country, but many countries, you know, Canada's came out with a relatively plant heavy guideline last year, which a lot of yeah. people have sort of decried. Are there any countries that we can use as models? I mean, I, I interviewed Gordon Guy at, you know, I'm not sure if you know, familiar with Gordon Guy, yeah. but he, he, yeah, but he basically said, we don't even have evidence to do any guidelines. I mean, we should just say to hell with it. And just, you know, I mean, it's, it's because the evidence is not, the nutritional evidence in general is so lacking, you know, cause you know, we talk about this epidemiologic stuff. And so our, I know some people use whole Brazil up as a, maybe a model. Do you have, do you see any countries that are maybe doing it the right way? Yeah, I want to just take issue with a little bit with Gordon Guy at what he says is what we do have strong evidence for is that what we're currently doing is, has been tested and, and shows no benefit. So what we should first do is roll back the, the existing guidelines, which have, there's quite a lot of rigorous evidence to show that our current guidelines are not, are, do not, are not supported by good science which is to say they've been tested and shown to be lacking. Is there any country that does it better? I don't think so. I mean, you know, Brazil is just saying don't eat processed food. And then they, um, so they just, they, I think the vaguer the better really. I mean, that's, that's a kind of vague uh, commandment. And, and I think that's probably just fine. They do, they did start this whole system of trying to classify foods as more, more highly processed and less processed. And I don't know if you know much about that. It's called Nova. And I think it's, I think it's a little bit of a um, joke of a system. I mean, in the sense that, well, first of all, you know, it's, it's really hard to know and just the, amount of processing doesn't necessarily make something bad. I mean, you know, you could call cheese a highly processed food, right? It goes through lots of steps for processing. Um, uh, cured meats in Italy, maybe, you know, go through various steps of processing. So it's just, it's not a very good system. It was also put together with people who clearly had a bias for, um, you know, the, the prevailing bias for a plant-based diet. So for example, they say bread is not a very highly processed food and just regular meat is not very highly processed. But if you put them together in a hamburger, that is a super highly processed food. <laughs> like, just because you put two pieces of bread around a piece of meat, that's a really highly processed food. And I, I talked to the guy who developed this system and I said, well, why is a hamburger in a highly processed food? And he's like, well, because you tend to buy it at a fast food chain where you will also buy a lot of other junk. And um, I was like, well, why, why lump it in with a better, why not separate out different food things that you would buy there and, you know, label French fries as highly processed. Anyway, it's just, it's a lot of their process, a lot of their classifications just don't make any sense to me. And, you know, I mean, I'm not, you, not even truly sure that, um, you know, my, my 20 part beef stew that takes an hour to cook, that's, that is that highly processed because it involves a ton of ingredients that make it taste better. I mean, I just think it's, a, it's a kind of like a end run around the real issues here, like. What we know is that things that come in packages and sit on shelves for years at a time is, is probably, probably, that's what we're talking about is how, in terms of highly processed, right? Not, not the, the, the complex things that you make at home. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's kind of like that back to the old days when they were talking about pornography, you know, you know it when you see it. And I mean, it's the same thing with the process. We know what we're talking about. We're talking about the junk food that's on the, you know, the, the stuff that sits on the aisles for 10 years and stuff like that. But what about um oh, wait i just want to say one thing sorry to interrupt sean but you know and you're totally right about that and then so what do you, do you need like do you need a government spending a hundred million two hundred million dollars just to tell you that like like that's pornography and that's not <laughs> if it's common sense then do we really need guidelines telling us that 
Like, of course we know Doritos are not good for us. Yeah, I mean, I think most people would, you know, I, I, there's a few people that may not, may not understand that, but for the most part, yeah. Hey, what about, um, you know, ADA, American Diabetes Association recently recognized low carb as a option for that. Is it possible that we can have some guidelines that will sort of not just be one size fits all, but hey, if you're in this category, this may be an option for it. Is that a possibility? Or does it have to be this one size fits all for the whole population? Well, that's one thing that we argue a lot. We argue a lot with this idea that, you know, how can you have a one size fits all diet for a population that is so extremely diverse, not just in terms of our degree of metabolic health, but, you know, uh, cultural differences, racial differences. There's, there's, a, you know, there's a tremendous diversity in the, the American population and why can we not have a genuine variety of diets? There is no one size fits all diet that fits everyone. Even, you know, as you know, here in your community, it does not one size fits all in terms of what, how people respond. Um, I think that, um, and this is, this is the argument that's been used to try to just bring in low carb, right? A lot of people, some people do well on high carb. I mean, I've met a few of them and I know they're there, but a lot of people do better with some reduction in carbohydrates. And, and so we need to have that as an option. Um, and, uh, and, and using the American Diabetes Association is pretty powerful because they say that the, uh, they say not just low carb, but actually very low carb ketogenic diet is good for a number of things. Um, including the management of diabetes, the prevention and management of diabetes. But here's another crazy thing about the dietary guidelines is that they say they're only about prevention. In other words, they're only for people who have not been diagnosed yet with um, a metabolic disease because they don't want to get into the treatment model. They feel like the treatment is for the expert, you know, the, the American diabetes people, the American diabetes association is for the treatment of diabetes. We're only for the prevention of diabetes. So we're only for healthy people is what they say. We're for the small minority of Americans whom we have not yet made unhealthy with our diet. So, and you know, you could say, so that's either 40% of the American population is currently non-diagnosed with a chronic diet related disease, according to the CDC. That's the, that's the largest number you can find. Or you can go with the 12% of people that are currently considered healthy by a recent study out of the University of North Carolina, which said that those only 12% of Americans are not taking some medication for a diet related disease. So that means that's who the dietary guidelines are for. They're for those people. And so that's why the guidelines will say, well, we're not gonna consider studies on say diabetes reversal, like the spectacular one that's been led by Sarah Halberg out of the University of Indiana showing you know, over half the population could reverse their diabetes in a year and sustain it for two or three years now. They're not looking at that study because that's a treatment study and they don't wanna look at treatment. They're only looking at prevention. And you cannot make the argument with them, although we have tried to say, look, it's a continuum, you know, re reversal of diabetes is reversal of prediabetes, same thing. So, but it's, um, again, you know, we're just, we're confronting like just a walls of bias that are very, very hard to penetrate. And there, it seems to be like whatever maneuver they can make to try to avoid, you know, seeing what's right in front of their face is, is, it's like, it's, it's why, you know, again, just getting back to this point and not trying to, you know, be so much of a advocate here, but like people have to really, people have to do a little screaming and shouting in order for this issue to be heard. I think that that's, you know, that the, we've seen now, I mean, I've been on this field, I don't know how long, Sean, you've been doing what you're doing, but I've, I've been doing this since about 2014. I know, you know, so many fine, great people, researchers, scholars, responding to papers, you know, writing in letters. I've written in letters to the Lancet, to this, to that, to this journal saying there was this flaw and that flaw. And 
calling out papers and trying to engage in legitimate scientific discourse, submitting public comments and saying, have you done this? Have you done that? What about, but there is no, this paradigm shift that we are, that is happening is there's so much reluctance and resistance to it that the, the, the kinds of civilized acts that we would like to, which is the way the process should shift and the way we would like to see it happen through letters, through discourse, through conversation, I do not think it will happen that way. Because I don't think that there are, I don't think that, that the existing, let's say the, the medical orthodoxy, the nutrition establishment, whatever you want to call it, I don't think that they want to hear the contrary evidence. Yeah, I mean, that's been my sort of thought. I mean, it's not that we shouldn't attempt to do that and try to do it through the academic channels. Um, as you may be aware that David Ludwig is doing a study on us crazy carnivore people. And I mean, I think more than any study out there, when you want to ask the question, is meat healthy or not healthy? This is a population you need to study. I mean, this is not confounded. It, it isn't the, you know, the average American who eats 2.4 ounces of beef a day, which is nothing. And, and, and yet it's blamed for all these, you know, ills of society. Um, what do you think? So I'm just because I want, we have a few more minutes yet, but you know, if people were to, you know, say we could get motivate all, all these people to, to step up and, you know, take action that would be effective. What do you think the result of that could be on this current dietary pr guideline process? I mean, what would you consider a big win at this point? And if we do nothing, what do you think the guidelines are going to look like? Okay, so two wins that I think are achievable. I think we can, uh, I think it's possible to ease or lift the caps on saturated fats if enough people really yell about that. Um, and again, remember, it would not just be you, it's this expert group of scientists with this, you know, with this consensus paper and this other paper coming out, a, a group, an equal group of, of European scientists did the same thing. There's a lot of evidence to show that the caps are no longer justified. And lifting those caps on saturated fats would have an immediate impact on the food supply. Number two, I do think it's possible that they could be pushed into providing a low carb dietary option. And, um, and say, just saying that that is you know, not for everybody. It's not, it's not, it's just, just to say that this is one safe and effective option. It doesn't have to be the primary option, but just to say it's, you know, that would say it would do several things. It would say it's no longer a fad diet. It's no longer a taboo diet. It's no longer a dangerous diet. It is one safe and effective option. And I think if people, if people call their rep Congress representatives and make enough noise, I think we can get those two things to happen. And if we don't, then they won't happen. And, and those are the two most important things that are currently being, that are currently under consideration. I mean, there's also the problem of the SALT guideline, which is wrong, but that is not currently being consideration, considered in these dietary guidelines. So those two things would do more to change the medical and food environment, I think, than anything else. And they're super important and they're science-based and we know that they would make people healthier. Nina, what is the, the most effective way that people can get their voice out there? I mean, do they call their congressman? Is there, I mean, what do you think is gonna make the, the biggest impact? If, if a person says, I wanna do something, but I don't know what to do. What would be the most impactful thing that person could do? At this point, I do think that um, calling your your con your representatives in Congress and and there are two ways you can find um, we've sort of made it easy. So you can go to Nutrition Coalition. There's a button on the home page. You can just hit and um, you it'll take you straight to the page where you know that 
You can write a little of your own text. There's text set up, you put in your zip code, they send you straight to where you need to go. You can write a letter, you can make a phone call. Um, and then that's, um, and then this other group, Low Carb Action, lowcarbaction.org has a similar page under uh, Take Action or similar thing. They've made it super easy. It's good to put your own personal message in there so it's not like a robo comment, which they will discount and, and put just a you know, few lines about why you're doing this and who you are. And then, and then there's um, some filler, there's text in there that you can use or not use. But I think that's just the most important thing. If we could get thousands of people doing that, I really think that um, the people who oversee these guidelines will, um, will really wonder, you know, well, why are so many people complaining? And again, it's because when I go to complain, people say, we just don't hear from enough people. You know, we hear from you, Nina, and we're all sick of you. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, you again. But we need to hear from more people. We need to hear from, we need to know this is concern to America. Yeah, Nina, I'm, I'm going to be crucified if I don't ask this question, apparently. So people just want to know what your diet is like, how much meat you're eating, how much plants are you eating. What do you, what do you currently eat these days? So, um, well, I don't need to disappoint you. I'm not a carnivore. Um, but um, I, I think I'm almost a carnivore. Also, you're asking me like during, you know, COVID-19 isolation where my 13 year old son has decided that his new project is going to be baking banana bread. So, um, so I'm like, <laughs> so, um, I forgot how much I like banana bread too. So, I mean, I'm not really, you know, I would say that I'm, I eat, uh, you know, I eat red meat. I eat red meat, I think pretty much every day. Um, I eat eggs, I eat cheese, I eat, I mean, I eat, and then, and then I have things that I just sometimes, I also eat, like I'll have crackers with my cheese, or I'll have a piece of my son's banana bread, but, you know, I, I stopped eating fruit, and I don't, um, I think I feel like the only points I get in my house is that I'm I'm not the mom who forces people to eat their vegetables because often we just don't have much on the table other than some greens. So, you know, I think I'm a pretty close to a carnivore. And um I I but I, I have to say that, you know, just in having teenage kids and um and feeling like I don't want to have to choose a lot of battles. I, 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 we're not in a super strict household in that way. And I don't do so much exercise as you do, Sean. I really, really yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a demented in the brain about exercise stuff. I mean, I've got this yeah, I should be more. mental illness with that, but, um, and you know, my kids the same way. I mean, I, I never force them to eat vegetables and they rarely ask for it. So, I mean, if it's, if they want it, they're welcome to have it, but they, they don't complain that they're eating steak almost every night. I mean, that's, I've never heard them complain about that once in a while. They're like steak again, but I mean, generally they're pretty happy to eat it. So anyway, well, Nina, we, we've run through an hour. It just flew by. You've got so much to say. And I want to just, um, thank you for what you're doing and, you know, hopefully it'll inspire more people. Like you said, the more voices out there, the more we can potentially make a difference. You know, I think uh, obviously, um, you know, as you've pointed out, we've been following the food guidelines. We've listened to what they've said. Our food system has reflected what we've been told to eat and we are nowhere near healthier before. We're in fact, we're, we're, we're far worse off. And so um, hopefully, uh, we can make a difference. Maybe some people will, will you know, take a stand and, and write their congressman and use those resources that will hopefully attach to the, to the, when this goes on, when it's recorded and put up on the internet. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can get some good news. Yeah, like it'd be nice to raise that saturated fat cap to, you know, don't worry about it like we do with cholesterol. So that would be, it would be very helpful. It would. Well, you ask great questions and it's really fun to talk to your community. I had no idea there was going to have all these people here. So it's fun to talk to everyone. Yeah. I mean, they, we, you know, we, I kind of filter through their questions because otherwise it's just to chaos when we got 50, 60 people trying to talk at the same time. So, but thanks again. And, and, you know, uh, 
Are you going to write another book anytime soon? Or what's the story with that? Have you, have you thought about doing yeah, a sequel? I, I, I do. I'm desperate to get back to writing. Um, I, I, I've, I've made a commitment to see, see through these guidelines and do whatever I can to try to change them. And um, so I'm doing that and it just precludes time for writing. But, uh, but I really, I've already started researching for another book that, um, you know, I, I feel like, again, it's like this terrible OCD compulsion um, that I feel like I need to get, <laughs> need to get to the bottom of the whole plant-based movement and all the money behind it and where that's all coming from and why, you know, I really want to understand all of that. In fact, I'm just about to record this um, lecture that I'm way overdue for, for Low Carb Denver. And it's, it's the beginnings of a bunch of that research. So you might want to catch that when they, when they put it out. But I, I think so many of us just wonder, like, where does all that money come from? And why is it, you know, why are there 50,000 websites on this? And I feel like people need to know what is, what that's all about. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with Belinda Fetke and her some of her investigative oh, stuff yeah. on that. She's a good resource on that. So we've we've talked to her as well. But anyway, Nina, thank you so much. Good luck to you. Uh, stay safe. Uh, hopefully, when all this blows over, we can, you know, we can eat a steak together at some point somewhere. If we actually want to get to go to one of these meetings, that all might have been can all my speaking invasions have been, you know, basically put on hold for, you know, yeah, who knows indefinitely. But. Well, I look forward to sharing a meal with you, Sean. It's All right. Fun. Awesome, guys. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna end it for everybody, guys. You guys, thanks so much. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks again, Nina. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Take care. All right, bye, guys.